Episode 40. Hello, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff, and I'll be your host as we listen to eyewitness encounters involving one of the most terrifying cryptids, Dogmen. Our guest tonight is Lisa from Australia. Lisa, welcome to Dogman Encounters Radio. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Give us a brief bio, please. I'm Lisa. I'm 49 this year. A mother, um, homemaker. That's about it. <laughs> well, that's more than enough right there to keep you busy. <laughs> oh, yes. Lisa, we've got a lot of encounters here to talk about tonight. Instead of having what amounts to small talk, let's dive right into this first encounter here, the one that you were telling me about that occurred in Corumban Valley. Yes. I was coming home from getting off work. It was roughly around 2 o'clock in the morning, around June, which is winter over here. And it was a crystal clear night and I was driving home, um, coming around a set of bends and coming down a, a slight hill, down onto a flat. And as I was just coming down off the hill, something caught my eye over on the right to me. What I saw was a wolf on two legs. I'd never, ever seen anything and never expected to see anything like that in my life. Absolutely scared the living Bee Gees out of me. But it happened so fast. All I can remember is coming down the hill and something catching my eye and this thing standing upright, looking straight at me. It was grey-blue colour. Wolf. Wolf is what comes to mind, even though we don't have wolves in Australia. And then I sort of snapped to and looked straight ahead because where I was is out in the country. We have to be aware that there's horses and cattle at all times. I can can remember. I just glanced back in the rearview mirror and, and it was following me. It was down on all fours, running behind the car. And I was so terrified that I had to keep my head on straight to get home. I can remember the drive home being absolutely terrified. I was probably two or three minutes away from from my home when I saw it. I can remember coming up to our driveway to turn in. I turned in and I hit the horn at the bottom of the driveway. And it's about a 200-yard driveway. By the time I got to the house, my mum had put the lights on and she could see the state I was in. I was absolutely terrified. We had two dogs. They were going off the rail, barking, and they had bristling hair and all of that. I yelled at mum, get inside, get the dogs inside. We did that, and I tried to tell her what I'd seen, but I was just so terrified I just couldn't put it into words. That was my first encounter. That's more than enough right there. If you had never had another encounter after that one, that would be enough for a lifetime. Before you had that encounter, had you ever heard about dogmen? Werewolves, as in movies, but no. Never, ever heard of a dogman, no. No, never. And even after my encounter, I couldn't, I couldn't find anything about uh, like there was werewolf stuff out there, but it wasn't until I came across your show that I'd realised what I'd actually seen. That encounter happened, oh, um, I was would have been around about 25, 26 when that happened, and I'm now 49, so I'm no good at math. <laughs> <laughs> well, that wasn't my favorite subject either. No harm, no foul there. <laughs> you know, the whole thing that you mentioned, Lisa, about werewolves really muddies the water for people who see dogmen. 
You've got all this information out there on the internet floating around about what werewolves are supposed to be or whatnot, which doesn't cross over too much of anything about dogmen. You're talking about, as far as dogmen go, something that looks that way 24-7-365, not a mythical situation where a human transforms magically into a monster. It's apples and oranges, even if a werewolf in its supposed final form looks almost identical, I would imagine, to what a dogman does. That doesn't help matters at all. That first encounter, I was just so confused because I just couldn't take in what I'd actually seen. You know, like, it takes a while to filter through your, whatever you want to call it, your psyche. It just, it, it was just so surreal that I'd seen it and I was so scared of what I'd seen. And it was the feeling that I got off it. It was just the whole situation was just, surreal and and I was traumatized over it for probably about a year and then I just just thought no you've got to get on with it and because where we live there's only one road in and one road out so I had no choice but to deal with it. (laughs) That's a hard pill to swallow. As far as that first encounter goes how close was that dog man to the back of your car when you said it was chasing you down the road? It was actually running along beside the car at first. It was virtually looking in the window at me at first. That's how close it was to me. And then I sort of put my foot down to get away from it. Now I looked back and I could see it running behind the car. So, yeah, it was running beside the car. But as I said, I put my foot down. I was going pretty fast to get away from it because I was so terrified. (laughs) Oh, I'll bet you were. I can't blame you there. If it was looking in the window like that, that's way too close for comfort. Now, having said that, Lisa, when did you lose sight of that dog man on your way home? Well, as you come down the hill where I spotted it, it just seemed to flow so fast. It just I just didn't seem to have much time at all. It was just seconds. It's all, it just seemed like seconds to me. Coming down the hill, I spotted it, and there's like a long flat that goes for about three, four hundred yards, and then it goes around a bend. Just before I got around the bend, I lost sight of it. But I know I was being followed. It's just a feeling I had. I knew I was being followed. I didn't want to take it home, but I had no choice because no matter where I'd gone, I didn't want to take it to anyone else's house. I know all the houses in the valley. I know all the people personally. And I didn't want to take it to anyone else's property, but I had to go home because I had no other choice. So if I'd had a choice of being able to keep driving, I would have, but I had no choice because it's just a dead-end road up the top of the valley, so I had no choice. Oh, sure, you did the best you could. You were put into a very difficult situation that would have made most people fall to pieces, but you handled it in stride. Like I said, I'm really impressed. Seeing one of these things with someone there in the car with you is bad enough, but the fact that you were alone, that just makes it all that much worse. Now, before we move on to your second encounter here, Lisa, please tell us where in Australia the Corumban Valley is. Corumban Valley is in Queensland. It's very close to the New South Wales border as well. It's on the Gold Coast, which is a big tourist area, well-known tourist area. I live about 20 minutes away from beautiful beaches. But I'm far enough away that I love where we were because we are out in the country. Beautiful country. Sounds like a beautiful area. Not just the Gold Coast, but where you're at as well. Those tourists, if they only had any clue on what's maybe 20 minutes away from them, maybe they wouldn't be so hot and heavy about heading to the Gold Coast. Yes, I know. (laughs) Yeah, that's not a comforting thought. No. and. That's part of the reason why I'm speaking out, because what I saw, I just don't want anyone 
having to encounter it, especially on foot. I'd hate to come across it where you couldn't get away from it fast, that's for sure. Well, I'm so glad you are speaking out on this. I know it's not easy for you to talk about this, but like I said, I'm so glad that you are doing so. I've gotten messages from more than a couple Australians that were almost thumbing their noses at me, telling me how glad they were that there weren't any dogmen over there, down there in Australia, like there are here in the States and in Canada and in Europe and a lot of other places. This was even after Kieran Pittman's episode of the show aired. They must not have heard that. But anyway, I'm, I'm glad, like I said, that you're helping to drive that point home that, yes, Australia does have their fair share of dogmen, too. Now, having said that, Lisa, let's move on to your second encounter. From what you told me, you and your husband were having a barbecue on the front veranda. We were. We just finished cooking. We're just sitting down to eat something. It was just before dark, not about half an hour from dark. And what we first took to be wild dogs, because we'd watched them come down the hill from the ridge. There was a big hill and got in front of the bales, which is a cow, you know, where they milk cows. We call them bales. I don't know what you guys call them. Um... They got down to the front of the bales and they stood up and there was at least five or six that we saw in a big group and they all stood upright. And as I said, we took them to be wild dogs until they stood upright and they were massive. How big? Well, from that far away, I'd have to say seven to eight feet tall, easy. That's just an estimate because from where we were, we were about... Oh, probably about 100 metres, 120 metres away from where they were to where we were. Ew. That was close enough. <laughs> yeah, that's way too close for comfort. <laughs> yes, that was very freaky. That was the second encounter and there was a big time gap in between the first encounter and that one. I just grabbed the kids, grabbed the food, took it all inside shut the door, shut the blinds, and, yeah, just hoped it all went away. <laughs> did anyone else see those dogmen when you were out there? From what you said, I think you said your husband did. Yes, my husband and my stepson saw it. We all saw it, yeah. Ew. We all saw the pack of dogs, and we all saw them coming down, because we used to see wild dogs on the ridge all the time coming down. They had cattle on the property. It was a big property that we were on. And it wasn't unusual to see wild dogs coming down. But as I said, until they stood up, that's when we realised, no, that's no wild dog. So, yeah, we got inside. Yeah, I'd say that was a smart move. Now, while all this was going on, from the moment that you noticed those dogmen, about 110 meters away or so, until the last time you looked their direction, did you ever notice them focusing on you, or were they seemingly just doing their own thing? Well, when they stood upright, they looked straight at us. And that's what I said, no, I'm going inside, I'm getting the kids inside, because my kids were only very young. So I got them inside. My husband stayed out there for for a couple of minutes watching because he couldn't believe it. And then he came inside and, yeah, we just all sat inside then until when we didn't hear any more after that, that night. After that, it all seemed to escalate. We had other goings on at the farm, other sightings. Just seemed to get worse after we saw it. It just seemed to get a lot worse. And they seemed to be, um, how would you put it? They seemed to be tormenting my stepson a lot by coming around. He lived in a big, like a big sleep out at the back of the house. It was all open at the back. Like it was all uh, glass windows, but it was, there was blinds and that, but he used to sleep with them up. And, we only used to see one that used to come around from the back of the house 
to the side of the house and walk along the back of his, like right on the, the veranda, and you could see its head, its eyes, the red eyes, the big shape of the head, the the ears, everything. You could see it walking straight past the windows, and it seemed to torment him a lot. Tap on the windows when it was out there, or...? No, not not to Kevin. Tapping on the windows, my four-year-old, he would have been. He came out one night to Rob and I. It was about 11 o'clock at night. And he walked up to us and he said, Mum, Mummy, I wish the dog would stay away from my window. Now, his bedroom window was at least six foot off the ground. And we just looked at him. We were flabbergasted. You could hear scratching and tapping on his window. And we always used to keep the blind down. But it wasn't until he came out to us that night that we realised what it was doing. That it was trying to attract his attention. And he was only four at the time. But as I said, it just took our breath away when he came out to us and said, Mummy, I wish that dog would go away. I'm glad that he was so young that he didn't realize what it really was. You talk about mental scarring. That wouldn't be good at all. No, no. He's been extremely lucky that he was too young to... He can remember certain things, but he can't remember that, which I'm grateful for. Thank goodness he can't. That is good news. With the second encounter that you were talking about here tonight, I wanted to ask you, I guess it's a safe bet to say that no one got a wink of sleep that night, did they? No, because they knew that we knew they were there, if that makes sense. After that encounter, when we saw the group, we never saw them in a group like that again. It was just the second encounter when they all stood up in that group. We never saw them in a group again after that. It was just one. But where you see one... And because we'd seen the group, we knew there was more. So that just alerted us, and we just never went out at night at all. My stepson used to go outside, and I and I just said, Are you, you're crazy, Kevin, knowing what's out there. You've seen it yourself. Why go out? He was in his 20s then. He was silly. <laughs> and that led to another encounter with, for him which we all saw and was absolutely terrified. Do you want me to go on to that one? I do in just a second here, Lisa. I want to ask you before we do cover that, though, if the pack of dogmen that you saw, five or six of them, if they were about 100 to 110 meters away, were they standing in, in grass where you could get a good look at their leg structure and all that or what? No, we didn't get a look at their leg structure, mainly because it was just too far away and going on dark. But when they stood up, you could see the ears and you could see that it was a dog, but a dog that stood on two legs. Like It it had the canine head. It had... I can't remember seeing the legs. Where they were, it was sort of down a slope a bit as well where they stood up it wasn't flat ground if they'd been standing on flat ground we might have but I can't remember seeing the legs all I remember is the ears, the head and the dark colour I just took off inside after that I didn't wait around to see any more oh I don't think anyone could blame you there If you would, please do tell us about the encounter that you were about to mention. My stepson had gone out to use his mobile, which you could only use out near the shed where we used to park the cars. It's a big shed. He was on one side of the barn. My husband was standing outside, um, on the veranda, not outside, on the veranda. He was looking straight at Kevin. He could see this dog man coming around from the back of the house. Kevin was at the front of the barn. There was the house, the barn, 
Kevin was standing in front and this thing was coming, like circling around from the back. It was night time. We had all the lights on because we had big spotlights out there. Kevin was talking on the phone and he was one side of the barn and the dog man was the other. My husband was yelling out to him to get inside. Very panicked. He, he had a panicked sound to his voice and that alerted me. And I've looked out the kitchen window, which you look out the kitchen window and you're looking at the barn to the side. My husband repeated again, Kevin, look behind you, get inside. And as he said that, he's come inside, he's locked the door, bolted the door. Kevin's looked behind him and started running because by then he could see it. And he's come in the side gate and he knew that we would have bolted the door. So he's come for the window, which I had open to come in like it was a big, a big window. He's jumped through the window, I've slammed the window shut and locked it and, and I was face to face with it. So I copped the full brunt of that one. Because it was the eyes. It was, it was so close behind him. It was incredible. The window would have had to be about six foot off the ground again. And it was looking straight at me through the window. When it was looking at you through that window, did it look like it had blood in its eye or was it just regarding you? Well, I've no hesitation in saying if it had got in, we would have all been ripped to pieces. Just the anger and the red eyes, fiery, fiery red eyes. That particular one that I saw up close, it was black. It had black fur, the shape of the ears, like what I've seen on documentaries of wolves, because of course we don't have wolves over here. But it was black. It was a different thing again to the first encounter that I saw. It was black. It was totally different. It had the pointy ears, the mane, like a big wolf's mane, big shoulders, seemed to have big shoulders. But it was mainly the eyes that, that got to me. It was, yeah, yeah, it was the eyes. That's mainly what I noticed with it was the eyes, the, the eyes, the intelligence and the intent and the rage that it had in its eyes. I was going to ask you what the scariest feature was, but from what you're seeing now, I think you've already answered that question. It would be the eyes, I take it. Oh, God, yeah. Because once you've looked it in the eye, it seemed, it's the, you, you can, you can grasp the intent that it's got, the anger, the intelligence. Very highly intelligent. I don't care what anybody says. These things are intelligent. If anyone, please, if you, if you ever see it, don't look it in the eyes. Please. That's really good advice. Very good advice. You're not the only person, if you've listened to the show, you already know this, but in case you haven't heard me say this on other episodes of the show, like you just mentioned, I always recommend, as far as giving out advice to people, if they think they have one of these things around, I always tell them, whatever you do, don't look at their face. If you don't look at the face, you won't know what their eyes look like. If you don't know what their eyes look like, you're doing yourself a huge favor. Because the eyes, that's what makes an eyewitness sit up in the middle of the night soaking wet with sweat. How scary those eyes are, boring holes through you and everything. And it was the intelligence. That's the thing that really freaked me out was the intelligence. You could virtually see in its eyes what it wanted to do to you, if that makes sense. It does make good sense. That's what got to me was the eyes. And that, that haunted me for quite a while with that encounter that it was the eyes because it was so close. I mean, it was faced to virtually looking, you know, I was one side of the glass and it was the other, and if it wanted to get in, it had the intelligence to get in. Knowing that, it, it just really put us on high alert after that, because we had other things happen. 
like it used to come to the back door and rattle it. I mean, blow on it and the door would have opened. We could never lock it. It was an old farmhouse and it used to rattle it just to let you know it was there. There's no uncertain terms of that. It would really rattle it. Yeah. It just used to do everything it could to um, put you on high alert. Robin, my bedroom, our bedroom used to outlook. Like um, it just used to come onto the front veranda where we'd been having that barbecue. It used to come onto the veranda and stand at that window. And our bed used to come. We had the bed up against the window. We never had it open all the way and we used to have it locked to a certain so it couldn't open it. But we used to leave it open a good two inches. And you could hear it out there. And you just freeze in the middle of the night. You just freeze because you knew it was there. There's just no two ways about it. And I think in one of the um, shows that you did, the bloke said the feeling that you get when they're around. I think it was last week's show I, I heard. The feeling that, that you get when, when they're around. Yeah, that's what we had big time. It's just this feeling. It's just, you. there's no words for it. It's just a feeling and you get to know that feeling really well. And it's like going on high alert. All the bells go off and everything slams down. That's what it's like. That's horrible. You and your family were prisoners in your own home. Basically, yeah. We were renting the house. We only stayed there for a year. We got out right out of the area after that. But I still have to go and visit because my mum's still there. Through the day, I'm not worried at all. Come night time, I get a bit antsy because we have been followed. I only live about 20 minutes away from where my mum is. I live in New South Wales now, but I'm only like 20 minutes away from where my mum lives. So it's not that far away. (laughs) And we have been followed home before by it to where we are now. It's called Tommy Wynn Road and it's a mountain like it goes across the ridge into New South Wales and we've been followed by the dog men by being at mum's and and leaving to to come home it's followed us at night so yes it's very intelligent a lot of people don't understand just how intelligent they are so just be aware be very aware oh without a doubt if your mother is living there Got two questions for you about her. Number one, has she seen one? And also, two, I wanted to ask you if she's afraid of them being around since I'm sure she has to know they're there. No, she's never seen one. Thank God for that. They have been around the house. We know that. My brother also lives with my mum. We've had different things happen at the house, but mum has never seen one and she'd just deny it anyway because she's very religious and anything that doesn't come into her religion doesn't exist, basically. Well, at least that's comforting. She's not sitting there worrying about them 24-7. I hope that doesn't leave her vulnerable, but at least she seems to be dealing with it really well. As far as that house goes also, Lisa, I wanted to ask you to back up just a little bit. That time when Kevin ran from that dog man and dove through that window, was it dusky dark when this happened or was it full-blown dark at that time? It was full dark, full dark. And being the country, we don't have any street lights around us. We had the floodlights on, so you could see it crystal clear. (laughs) So. Hmm. But normally around the property, it is very dark at night. It's very, very dark. There was another incident that happened. I'm not clear whether this happened when you lived there at that house, but there was an incident where you had a knock at the front door. Yes, it was at the same property. Um, I was asleep. My stepson had come in to tell me there was someone at the door 
So he went and answered the door and I came out and there was a group of three or four young blokes saying, we've hit your dog. I said, what do you mean? And then he explained that, that they've been coming along and it's 80 kilometres along this big flat where we were. They were coming along, heading to Corumban, and they'd hit a big black dog. He said they, it was a big black dog, and they'd hit it, and it had gone over the bank. They'd stopped, and they got out, and they were searching down on the bank for it, and they were searching for it for about 10 minutes, and they came over to us, and they were saying that they'd hit our big black dog and I just looked at him and I said mate we don't have a big black dog I said to him if you know any of the myths and legends of Crumman Valley I said you get back in your car and get going and don't stop for anything because that I'm sure was the dog man that they hit yeah that's not a good situation having them out there looking around for this supposed black dog in the dark not good no and the same thing happened to my brother as well where I had my first encounter he was coming home with a friend of his and he hit a black dog he stopped the car and he got out and was searching for it and he couldn't find anything and he just hopped back in and there was a big dent in the car where he hit the dog on the back panel of the car he said it just wasn't there I said do you realise what you hit he said, but I didn't realise until I got back in the car. Where I had the first encounter, that's where he'd hit the dog. Well, sometimes you're better off not knowing what's really going on. It sounds like that's exactly the situation he was in. If he had known what was going on, maybe that wouldn't have been as good as how it turned out. Yeah. Yeah, he was very lucky. Oh, <laughs> I'd say so. You briefly mentioned a legend that was yeah. created in and around that Corumban Valley, Lisa. Could you tell us about that legend? Oh, there's just supposed to be a legend of a werewolf in Corumban Valley that walks the road, so to speak. And of course, when I had the first encounter knowing that story, that's what I thought it was at first. Because as I said, I'd never heard of Dogman before. It just walks the road. You know how some legends stretch way back, so far back that no one really knows when or how they got their start. With that legend of the werewolf of the Corumban Valley, is that something that's more of an urban legend that came to light maybe 10, 20 or so years ago? Or is that a legend that just stretches back so far in time that no one has an idea around that area when it got its start? Well, people started moving into Crumlin Valley in the early 1900s. And as far as I know, the story goes back to where the first families came into the valley. Well, you know how it is, Lisa, with a lot of legends, maybe even most legends, they get their start because of having some basis in fact. Considering what you've been seeing around there, I don't have to guess how that legend got its start. Exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yes. Moving on, you had a 17-year-old nephew who saw a dog man. Tell us about that, please. It wasn't actually my nephew. It was two of his mates. They were camping down on the flats, directly down in front of my mum's. My nephew had come back to his nan's house, my mum's house, for something. I don't know what it was, and he left his two mates down there. Now, while he was away, he went back, and the two boys that had stayed on the flats were absolutely terrified because they said they saw a black dog, and they were terrified by it, and they all had to go back up to Mum's to stay the night. They weren't going to stay down there, not after what they'd seen. Yeah, I don't see how a camp out could ever be the same if you knew that one of these things was prowling around. No, and I think that's how it moves through, is along along the creeks, because the creeks don't have 
house is too close to them because it floods. So all the houses are sort of back off the creek. And I think that's how they move through unseen is along the creek, uh, you know, following the creek down. I think that's how they move through not being seen is down along the creeks. That makes sense. Around that area, Lisa, have you noticed more activity in the summer than in the winter? In a lot of areas, there doesn't seem to be any difference in activity, whether it's amazingly cold outside or not, but I wanted to see how things were with you and your area. The first two encounters were getting into winter. My first encounter would have been in May, June, and my second encounter, I saw that around the same time, May, June. But at the farmhouse, it just kept coming around all the time after that. Your youngest son had a strange encounter with one. Please tell us about that encounter. My son was up on the hill at his nan's property. It's a very steep hill. On mum's property, it's all cleared. But the next door property, there's a lot of scrub. Real scrubby, like real... Real thick bush. I don't know what he was up there for. He just roams mum's property like he always has. He's not scared of being on the property at all. He was coming back down the hill and he said to me that this dog had brushed past him. But he said it wasn't a dog. At the time he probably would have been seven or eight. He wasn't terrified. He just said it brushed past him. It didn't bump him, it just brushed past him. It just happened that fast that it came out of of the scrub and the woods to where he was and brushed past him. I didn't know what to think on that one. I I don't want to think too closely on that one. (laughs) (laughs) I can't say I'll blame you. It makes you wonder what that was all about, what it had on its mind to do something like that. I have no idea. I've got my theories, but I mean, that's just my theory. I'd love to hear it if you wouldn't mind sharing it. Well, my theory is they know who lives on the properties and who are the visitors. They know. I've no doubt they know. They just know. Because most of the properties out at Crum and Valley are um, 10 acre, 20 acre, up to 100 acres. They're all fully wooded, like they a lot of them have a lot of wood on them, bush. I have no doubt that they know who's meant to be there and who isn't. I've no doubt of that. Yeah, they do seem to be, like you said, really smart, too smart for comfort, unfortunately. Very. Anyone who knows that they're around and is very blasé about it, very, very silly. <laughs> That's all I can say. That wouldn't be a good move to let your guard down at any time when you know that they're around. You mentioned all the woods in that area, Lisa. Are there any Yowies reported as being seen in that area? Yeah, they have been, yeah. Wow, sounds like you've got a hodgepodge of all kinds of cryptids running loose around that area. That's a totally different subject. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'd say so. That's a whole show in and of itself right there. Other than your family, have you heard of any other people in that area having dogman encounters of their own? No, I haven't. Because it's not spoken about, as I said in the first interview. It's just not spoken about. You don't hear anything. I have heard of cases of animals being tied up at the back of houses and they've come out in the morning and these animals are just ripped to shreds. Nothing in Australia could do that, like just ripped to pieces. The worst we've got are snakes. Crocodiles aren't anywhere near where we are. (laughs) We've got snakes, we've got spiders. They're about our worst thing. We don't have bears, we don't have wolves, we have dingoes, but dingoes wouldn't even rip anything like that. 
just shredded, apparently. There was a property out behind Mum's. They'd tied a goat to the back of the house on a big lead. When they came out in the morning, the animal was just shredded, just ripped apart. Hmm. If you hadn't have had all that activity and all those encounters with dogmen like you've had, I guess I would leave you scratching your head, wondering what could have done that, but having seen what you've seen, there doesn't seem to be much of a mystery as to what did shred those animals that were tied up behind the houses and everything. Yeah, I've no doubt what it was. I know there has been other cases. They just thought it might have been a Yowie that had done it. This is going back in the 1970s. There was a case of a greyhound farm being up the valley, further up than my mum's. They had the racing greyhounds. They tied this greyhound up to a tree and I think it was one of the sons had found it ripped to pieces. Still tied up, but ripped to pieces. That was back in the 70s. So that was a while ago. It's just pretty scary that people have had animals tied close to the house and they've walked out and they've just found them ripped to pieces. I mean, it's just incredible. But there's been quite a few few cases of that that I've heard in the valley. So It is incredible and it is scary, the idea that they do things like that. There was another encounter, Lisa, that you mentioned to me about a gentleman who was, I believe this gentleman jumped into a pool somewhere out in the bush and found out that he unfortunately wasn't alone. Could you tell us about that? That was my husband, Rob. He'd gone camping at a place called Natural Arch, which is near Springbrook, which is in Queensland. He'd gone camping, he decided to go and have a swim. It's a big natural arch. The waterfall comes through the middle of the cave, drops through the middle of the cave, and there's a big area that you used to be able to go swimming in. He'd been sitting beside the cave. Like, the cave's open, it's all open, but it's very dark. He was sitting on the edge, and he decided he'd better swim back over because he had gotten hungry and it was starting to get a little bit dark. So he got in the water and started to swim over and he heard three plops. He wasn't the only one in the water. There was another bloke in the water further over. He turned and what he saw was three canine-looking forms in the water. They were obviously standing on the bottom because their chest was right out of the water. He could see the chest and the head. And of course, he was absolutely terrified. He um, got out and dove into his tent and curled up there for he doesn't know how long. He just said the screech that this thing let out was incredible. He said it absolutely turned him inside out. He finally got enough wits to get himself out of the tent and into the car and up this road that they had to get up. Natural Arch is the type of place that you don't drive at night because it's a mountain. It's a very mountainous road. It's very dangerous. He said he stopped the car and he ran to the toilets and locked himself into the toilet. He just curled up in a ball. He said he thought he was dead that night. He could hear them outside walking around. And as he said, he just thought he was dead. He just thought his life was gone. He was waiting all night for these things to break in and kill him, basically. He had a big breakdown over it. He was that traumatised from it. He um, put himself into a mental asylum for about three or four months because he just couldn't believe what he'd seen. And it just, and still to this day, it terrifies him, absolutely terrifies him to um, even speak of it. You can hear the terror in his voice. It's just horrible. Wow, that's just too much for anyone to have to go through. Rob saw what he saw. I hope that he is able to deal with it the best way he can and pull through it. I've spoken with Rob before. He sounds and seems like a really nice guy. He's gorgeous. He's seen a lot, 
and being around a lot. He's not a bloke that would back off. He doesn't scare easy. But as I said, what he went through, that was his first encounter and, and it just terrified him. He didn't know what to think, what to feel after seeing that. He just, his life was turned inside out. So, yeah, that's what happened to him. His life was turned inside out as anyone who had gone through something like that, their life would have been turned inside out as well. When we talked about that the first time, Lisa, I think you mentioned as far as how deep that water goes in that pool where the dogmen were standing, where the water was hitting them across the chests. Didn't you tell me that that water would have been over Rob's head if he had tried to stand up? It was. He could not touch. He's five foot seven, and these things were standing upright in the water, and their chest was out of the water as well as the head. So he said they would have had to have easily, easily been eight foot, if not bigger, because he never found out how deep that water was. He couldn't touch. So it's hard to know just how big they were, but. He said he'd have to estimate it at eight to nine foot tall. They'd have to have been to be standing upright. They weren't swimming. They were walking. Yeah. And there were three of them. Yeah. Yeah. And apparently he he wasn't alone at the campsite. There was about ten people that saw it and they all got out. But Rob was the last one to get out. As I said, the road that leads to Natural Arch is too dangerous to be taken at night if you don't know it really really well i wouldn't take it because it's very windy it's very mountainous you know yeah it sounds to me like he did the only thing he could they sure know what buttons to push to send people over the edge with fear the fact that he locked himself into that public restroom there and they still were walking around outside just trying to scare him to death that says it all right there about where they're coming from. That's horrible. Yeah. Knowing he was alone by himself, he didn't go camping with anybody else. He just went by himself, and it was a well-known spot. There was always other people there camping. They would have all seen it, and they would have all heard it when it screeched. Well, his words, it screeched. He said it just froze his blood when it screeched. That's what did it for him. It was the scream that really put him over the edge. It was the scream, screech, whatever you want to call it. I've heard that scream that they make. I call it a scream. It's it's not a howl. It's not a it's not a screech. It's just it's a sound by itself that you just can't explain. It just makes you sick to the stomach. It brings instant fear. It's a sound that, that you can't describe. I, I couldn't describe it. It was just awful. It's the most, it just curdles your blood. Yeah, that screaming sound that they make, that's something that the last three guests, if I remember correctly, they've all mentioned that screaming sound that they make and how horrible it is. So, yeah, it's not just you who's heard that and has had to try and get over hearing something like that. Well, that was his big thing. Mine were the eyes. His was the scream, screech, whatever you want to call it. That's, that did him in. That haunted him for quite a while, and it still does to this day. He gets um, very, very nervous. As, you know, he, he's, he's talked to me about it, but he wouldn't talk to anybody else because he just gets too overwhelmed with it. it he can see it in front of him again and it, it's horrible it's horrible i don't have that reaction i don't know why i i have no idea all i know is it wasn't going to take my life you know like it wasn't going to overrule me it's my life to lead and i'm going to lead it this thing's not going to get the best of me and that's how i got over it but as i said rob has never got over it as I said to you in the first interview, there's nothing on the dog man in Australia. There's just nothing. There's just nothing. You cannot find information. 
unless you look it up on YouTube and then you get all of the American stuff, which thank God I did because that's where I found a lot of the information. But originally when I saw it, I tried to find information on it and I couldn't find anything, nothing that even resembled it. And that's very frustrating um, because, I mean, I couldn't have been the only one that, that has seen one of these things. I knew that, but how I could find other people, I just, I had no idea. It wasn't until I came across your show that, um, that I've actually been able to listen to other people's encounters and, and thought, oh, thank God I'm not the only one out there that has seen one of these things. I'm not going mad. It puts a real strain on you. How do you explain it? You can't. You can't explain it to yourself, let alone anyone else. It's just the way it is. As I said, especially in Australia, because there's no information at all on the dog man. So you've got to research somewhere else. And my son put me on to the dog man encounters. So thank you, Jakey. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad that he did find the show and was able to let you know about it. The fact that you found the show and it's helped you, that right there is what makes this whole Dogman Encounters thing worthwhile. That's why I created the show, was to help someone just like you. The fact that you felt so isolated, you were in a place, Australia, where there really wasn't any information or support on these things, like you just said. Having that resource, that information there that you found when you found out about me, the fact that it helped you, I can't tell you how much that means to me. That's such good news. As far as Rob goes, please do remind him. Sometimes for someone who has lived through a nightmare like Rob has, sometimes the best thing to do is not to talk about it. But at other times, the best thing someone like that can do is to talk about it. If there ever is a time where I could help by talking to Rob about how he's feeling about what happened to him, answer any more questions for him, please do let him know I'm always here. That's great to know. Thanks, Vic. Oh, you know you're welcome, and you know I mean it. I've got a question or two for you left here, Lisa, before we close this show out. The first thing I wanted to ask is, when was the last time you saw a dog man? The last time I didn't see it, I heard it. It was here where we live now. Roughly about four years ago, I was sound asleep. We're in suburbia. I'm not out in the country. We were in a small country town. It started off as what I took to be at first howling. It got closer and closer as it came down the street. That was about five years ago, roughly, around this time of the year coming into winter. This is right in town. I was blown away by that because I thought I was quite safe in suburbia, but, yeah, obviously not. (laughs) Not to scare you, but, yeah, they do, unfortunately, come into areas like that where you wouldn't expect them to come into. Where we are, there's sugar cane right around us. It's a sugar cane district. And we're sort of on the edge of town. And, yeah, it it scared the living Bee Gees out of me. It, literally, my heart went up. Because I just never expected... I mean, if I'd looked out my window, I could have seen it. But there was no way I was sticking my head out that window. No way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't say I'll blame you there. My last question for you here, Lisa, before we close this show out would be, what would you tell any of the people who live there in Australia that don't believe dogmen are there? My advice, anyone who lives on properties, just be aware of what's around you, especially if there's strange things going on as animals being attacked. Tapping at your windows. Just be aware, please. 
and be safe, especially if you've got a family. Please be safe. Putting your kids' lives and your family's lives at risk is just not worth it. That makes really good sense. Well, Lisa, I know talking about this is not easy for you. I can't tell you how much. I appreciate you coming on the show here and helping to get the word out. Like you said earlier, there are a lot of people there in Australia that just don't know that dog men are there. They're a reality. Well, Lisa, thanks again so much for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Dick. Have a great night. You too. Thanks. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter and you want to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, you can reach me at contact at dogmanencounters.com. I'd love to hear from you.